Yeah, awesome. Thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, we're just going to run through some introductions. Uh, my name is Andrew Stoikis. I'm a member of the Office of the CTO at Red Hat and currently maintain the SIG Network Policy API repo housing the new Admin Network Policy API. Hi, I'm Bowie. I've been contributing to SIG Network uh, for the past five years, working at Google. And I'm Rob, and I've also been working at Google, contributing to SIG Network for a few years, not quite as long. Uh, and I, you can blame or thank me for Endpoint Slice, uh, Ingress getting to GA, and some topology stuff. But more recently, I've been doing a lot of Gateway API work. So I'm one of the maintainers of the Gateway API project. Hey everyone, I'm Surya. I work at Red Hat on the OpenShift networking team. I'm relatively new to SIG Network, and Kubernetes not the veterans as these folks here are, but I am trying to get involved in admin network policy. I know a bit of Kip proxy, so yeah, hit me out if you want to know anything about these things. Yeah. Cool. Uh, well, I am going to be going through the first part of this, and that's going to be an overview of the API. So we have not much time. I think we've got a 35-minute slot, and we're going to try and do both an intro and deep dive, which means we really can't get that deep in any one area. But to start, we're going to go through an overview of the APIs that networking, SIG Network, owns. And to start with, let's talk about service. How many of you have a service in your cluster? OK, that should be all of you. Great, great. OK, so service is really the foundation, I think the central thing inside uh, SIG Network resources. Uh, they enable uh, you know, basically grouping pods together uh, behind some kind of network concept. Uh, you can see here that that's done with a service selector. So in that case, pods labeled app equals store are going to be selected by this service. Uh, services are usually assigned IP addresses that they can be reached on, and requests to those addresses will be routed uh, to one of the associated pods. Now, most of you may, have, may be familiar with the concept of a service type, and there's really four service types here. And three of them are very closely related. Uh, you know, you've got a cluster IP service type, which is a subset of a node port service type, which is a subset of a load balancer service type. And then way over here on the other side, you've got external name, which is just it's completely other thing. It's a, basically a C name that does some DNS resolution for you. Now, reaching a service is fairly straightforward. Uh, each service is assigned one or more cluster IPs. Uh, depending on if you're using multiple IP families. Uh, so in this case, you can take that cluster IP and make a request to it, and you'll be routed to one of the pods backing that service. Uh, now, we also have a DNS spec specification in Kubernetes that allows you to, instead of knowing the IP of the service, just know the, serv the name of that service and make a curl request using that name. So store dot the namespace it's in and then service cluster local now within kubernetes we go one step further and we do some automatic lookups for you so instead of typing all that out if you're making a request from within the same namespace you can just curl store and we'll do a few lookups and eventually translate that to store prod service cluster local now endpoints and endpoint slices are really how this works behind the scenes so you remember that service is the thing that selects pods, but we need something behind the scenes to actually track all the IPs and ports associated with those pods and make them make sense. So the endpoints resource is the one that's existed since very, very early on in Kubernetes. And it's just one big Kubernetes resource that tracks all the IPs and ports for the pods in your service. With endpoint slices, that's a newer resource, and that basically is sharded endpoints. So there became a time where services started to get really big. We saw services with, say, 10,000 endpoints. Uh, and that just didn't work very well trying to shove all that information into a single Kubernetes resource. So instead, to try and address that kind of scale, we split it out into several endpoint slices per service. Uh, most new features in Kubernetes are going to endpoint slices. So Although the Endpoints API is stable and will continue to exist forever, as far as I know, uh, the Endpoint Slice API has new features and is more broadly used at this point. So things like dual stack, topology aware 
our routing and terminating endpoints have all been unique to endpoint slices. Now, gateway and ingress, uh, something that I'm very familiar with, uh, is, a, you know, first, ingress is an API that many of you may be familiar with. Just quickly, how many of you have used the ingress API? Okay, that's a lot. Great. Okay. So the ingress API is really L7 load balancing configuration inside your Kubernetes cluster. It's existed for nearly five years, maybe more than five years. That's forever in Kubernetes era, at least from my perspective. Uh, and it allows you to forward to, to a service, uh, configure path matching, and do some very, very basic TLS configuration. Um, it's been stable for a long time, and it's great, but it has a very small feature set. Um, with Gateway API, we're trying to do the next generation to enable you know, much more expressive and portable configuration in this API, and much, much more. I don't, there's, there's been several talks on Gateway API here. I, I can't go into everything here, but really Gateway API rec represents the next generation of Kubernetes load balancing and routing APIs. Uh, it's designed to be ex extensive and expressive, uh, and really one of the key things here was a role-oriented resource model. If you're familiar with Ingress, there's a single Ingress resource, uh, and that just didn't scale to every uh, workload in the cluster. Uh, some organizations may want to configure their load balancing infrastructure separately from their routing infrastructure or their applications. And this is designed with that in mind to split those up into different resources. So the gateway class, if you're familiar with ingress class, the storage class is nearly identical to that. HTTP route is nearly identical to the ingress resource. And Gateway is really a new resource, a new concept in Kubernetes that represents, you know, uh, the entry point to your system, a cloud load balancer, a instance of a proxy in your cluster. Uh, and again, lots more that we don't have time to get into right now, but I'll just show you really quickly the difference between an ingress resource and an HTTP route resource. Now, if you start at the very top here, you're going to see that an ingress class name, an ingress meant that the engine X ingress should implement that ingress resource. In HTTP route, it's a similar concept, but we have a parent refs field, and that points up to a gateway, and that gateway says uh, that I'm going to attach this HTTP route to the gateway named nginx, and you could attach to any number of gateways, and they'd all implement the same HTTP route. Uh, both of these do exactly the same thing. They do a prefix match on slash login, and they forward traffic to the auth service on port 8080. Uh, there's a ton of work going, in, get, going on in Gateway API. It's a SIG network subproject. Uh, I am always, always looking for more people to get involved. We have so many things going on. We actually have two meetings every week. So there is no shortage of opportunities to get involved and help us out. Uh, focus areas right now, this API is right now most stable with Ingress, but we're taking the same concept and applying it to Mesh. We have lots of exciting work going on there. There was a talk earlier this morning showing how this, it's called Gamma, the, the sub-project within Gateway API that's focused on mesh, and that's really move, moving forward quickly. So that's meeting every Tuesday. Then the main project as a whole that focuses on ingress and everything else meets every Monday, and we have so much work to get to, uh, whether it's mesh, L4 routing, uh, L7, moving that up to GA from beta, we're working a lot on conformance tests. There's so much to get involved with. Uh, just this week, we introduced a new to tool called Ingress to Gateway that allows you to take Ingress resources in your cluster and convert them to Gateway API resources. Lots of places to jump in and help out if you're interested. And as always, we appreciate contributors from all backgrounds. Uh, you can find us on our website. That's what the QR code goes to, or, or on Slack, or on GitHub. If you're a user, we really appreciate you showing up to the meeting. So not just the maintainers. So next up, we have network policies. How many of you have used network policies or known it? Well, yeah, that's expected because it's been around for a really long time, five years, I think. It's a stable core V1 policy. And it's a powerful API that actually allows um, app owners to be able to regulate their network traffic. 
So um, you can specify constructs like I want my backend pods to be reachable only from my frontend pods, or I want my databases to be reachable only from my backend pods. So um, it, it, it really allows the app owners to be able to define how they want their multi-tiered apps communication to look like. Can also be for security reasons, can also be for different enforcing different levels of policies on your apps. So it's mainly developed for app owners. And as you, as you can see at the example over here, so you can express um, such kinds of constructs in an easy way using the network policy API. And a sample YAML for a network policy object would look like this with kind network policy. They are namespace scoped. So you have to define the namespace in which you want to define the policy in. And in the specification, you can specify a pod selector, which is a mandatory field. And using match labels, you can say um, which pods in a specific namespace you want the policy to be applied to. And usually you can see ingress or egress types as uh, the type for a policy. And they are independent of each other. So in our case, we wanted to define a rule that says my backends should only receive traffic from my front ends, right? So you can express that saying, oh, I'm going to apply the policy on my backend. And uh, if the ingress traffic is coming from my front end, which I've expressed using match labels and namespace selectors, uh, I allow it. Looks simple, but one catch here is that they're implicit. The API is quite implicit in nature, so you have a baseline default deny. So everything works until you create that policy, and then nothing works, right? You have that default deny rule that gets created, and the allow rule that you're specifying here create, gets created on top of that. So it's an allow list mechanism. Something to be careful about if you're using network policies for the first time. Um, and like I said, the ingress and egress are separate. So if you have an object that defines only ingress rules, egress is unrestricted. So the default deny only applies to the type of rules that you have in your object over here. So this is namespace scoped. It's defined for namespace owners, app owners. So you might be wondering as a cluster admin, how can I enforce policies on a more cluster scoped level or cluster wide level? And that's where admin network policies come into play. It's a relatively new API that's under active development. And this is defined for cluster admins. It's on a cluster scope. So you might have use cases like what I've shown in the diagram here. You have a security sensitive namespace. You want to be able to express that all other namespaces in the cluster should not be able to talk to this namespace. And that can be achieved using ANP. Um, here's how a typical ANP object would look like, um, kind admin network policy. In the spec, you can define a priority field. This is a bit different from network policy. So every object has a priority, and um, all the rules inside the object will get the same priority. You can have more than one rule in the object. That's similar to network policies. And a subject here is the objects on which you want to apply the policy on. So it can be namespaces, it can be pods, and they're expressed using match labels, because uh, it's the same, and you must be familiar with this because of network policies. Um, what's really unique here when compared to network policies is that they're explicit in nature. So if you look at the ingress rule, we are defining the action deny. So we are explicitly saying that I want to deny or drop traffic that's coming from namespaces that are not myself. So in this case, the sensitive NS namespace, any namespace that's not from sensitive namespace, all that traffic will get dropped. And it's not any implicit um, thing that's happening behind the scene. It's more um, we are defining it in the actions. So uh, it's helpful for the admins because it's like a traditional firewall. You literally get what you are, you know, what you're asking for. Uh, the API has two kinds of objects, admin network policy, which you saw over here, and there's a new one called baseline admin network policy, which is a bit unique. I will not go into the details of that, but please do check out our documentation for more details. Um, so yeah, let me end this section of policies by just saying that it's a new API. It's v1 alpha 1 right now, um, and we are supporting east-west traffic for this version of the API. The north-south traffic is very much in play. It's a work in progress. Um, and if you have use cases, for example, uh, you want all the namespaces in your cluster to be able to receive traffic coming from the monitoring namespace, because you have metric pods that want to scrape everything, right? And you don't want the namespace owners in the cluster to be able to override these rules. That's when you have to use ANPs, because ANPs are the top in the chain when you evaluate them, and none of the namespace owners are, um, or app owners, they cannot override these rules. Um, or you want to do tenant isolation, for example, or maybe you want to just be an admin and say, 
if my traffic is matching a specific set of pods, I don't know what to do with them. So in that case, I'm going to just pass that over to the network policy. So you can also express that in ANP. It's an interesting use case. So ANP interacts with NP in that manner. You can just delegate the power to the, to the app owners in, in some scenarios if, you, if that's what you like. So what are the next steps here? Implementations. So that's where we're at. We are trying to get some initial implementations out of this API. That's where we need your help. We have a SIG network policy API Slack channel. We also have bi-weekly commun um, community meetings happening, so please join them. We need feedback from all of you. So if there's something new that you'd like to see in addition to what we already have, or there's some use case that we have not considered that you might want to see, please reach out to us, and we would love to include that in our V2 alpha 1 of the API, V1 alpha 2 of the API. So the next area, multi-network, I get to present all the cool new things, I guess, because this is a really new area. Uh, we have a new SIG as well. Um, what, so this effort is mainly just focused on trying to be able to express more complex networks than the traditional pod networking that we have in Kubernetes. Like you might want to be able to express things like, I want my workloads to be able to connect to isolated secondary networks through performance efficient interfaces like SRIOV. Or you might want to say, I want my apps to be able to talk to on-prem networks. So in order to express these, we are trying to come up with an API. It's very much in the design phase. It's a completely new area. So. I have a QR code here which points to the design doc that is in play right now. And we also have a SIG network, multi-network. That's a lot of networks, but I think that's the goal of this effort. Uh, a Slack channel, so please go join there. Um, we also have bi-weekly communi um, community meetings here. Um, so yeah, welcome. We, are, we would love to have contributions from all fields. I'll hand it over to Andrew. Sweet, thanks, Surya. So we've talked a lot about APIs, like we love APIs. Um, it's a lot of fun to develop an API, but it can get a little bit exhausting for developers uh, past a certain point. So let's talk about some of the actual networking components that SIG Network owns currently. So the first one is Cube Proxy. Who here uses Cube Proxy? Awesome, a lot of people, so we like to see. So most folks might know this, but Cube Proxy is basically a in-tree controller that essentially allows us to take the services and endpoints API that uh, Rob talked about earlier and convert that into per node uh, data path networking rules. So it is a per node agent and it basically allows us to just direct traffic on a, a node basis. Um, it is pretty stable. It's been in-tree for a long time and we have a pretty dedicated group of maintainers who make sure it stays up and running. So let's talk a little bit more about it. So like I said before, it's implemented in core Kubernetes. And we have, well, we had three different modes. We had IP tables, IPVS, and user space. User space has been deprecated, and we are currently only maintaining IP tables and IPVS. So this diagram kind of shows a typical workflow that QProxy handles. As you can see, a user comes in and creates a service. Awesome. So what does QProxy do? It sees that service, and it makes sure that it sets up the, in this case, correct IP tables rules to direct the cluster IP of the service all the way to the back end of the pod. And these are kind of a really abbreviated list of a really complicated IP tables uh, list that QProxy is maintaining on every single node. And obviously, it's really important because we have a lot of people using it. So super stable. We want to keep it that way. But at the same time, we also want to keep an eye on the future. And so we've been really thinking, what's next? Right? Um, how do we implement new backends? How do we do some exciting new things? So enter Kaping, KPNG, QProxy Next Generation, whatever you want to call it. Um, we like a ping just because it sounds like we're pinging off something. It's kind of where we're going next. So basically, Kaping provides two major value adds today. It's very early in its iteration cycle. It's uh, being done outside of core Kubernetes in the Kubernetes SIGs organization. And it provides a fundamental separation between the Kubernetes API and backend implementations. So this allows new contributors to come in and write these backends really easily and really quickly which is really exciting, and I know 
a bunch of folks have wanted to do that for a while. Um, today it also provides an extremely flexible deployment model. So as you can see in this diagram, uh, in this specific deployment model, rather than having a per node agent, we have a single KPNG daemon that basically serves an API that the backends implement and then can write whatever networking, they, networking rules they want to. So as I said before, this is still all kind of out of tree. Um, so development's really fast paced and we're still kind of figuring out um, exactly what's gonna fit back in tree and if we want it to fit back in tree. But we know that uh, the next generation of backends are gonna be done via Kaping and not really in the standard Qt proxy methodology that we had been following before. So these are some of the current backends that are already available. Super exciting, super new. As I said before, um, user space was deprecated from the entry cube proxy, but we've picked it up here. And Kaping can be used as kind of an in, a drop-in replacement. Like we have no inclination that we're gonna remove cube proxy anytime soon or ever, kind of like endpoints, right? But we wanna allow folks to kind of move forward as well. So this is where we've come to. So today we have an IP tables backend, NFT, IPVS, user space as I mentioned, Windows. Um, SIG Windows is actually helping train maintainers to maintain the Windows backend for Kaping at the moment. We also have a really basic eBPF POC uh, kind of going off some Cilium principles. So huge shout out to Cilium for um, giving us some ideas there. And way more to come from everyone here, right? We want to hear what kind of backends y'all are looking for, and we wanna see what you think is gonna happen next. That's kind of the goal. Another thing I really wanna talk about with Kaping that has been really fun for me personally is it's a extremely new project, so contribution is not weighed down by a ton of core Kubernetes bureaucracy and stuff. Um, it's moving fast. We have a lot of contributors who maybe have never pushed any code before and they're getting to kind of work into this ecosystem and the community has been amazing. So please, please, please get involved. Let's hear from you. Um, these slides are gonna be attached to our SCED link so you can definitely find these links there. Um, but I attached three just to get started. Dan Winship, who's in the crowd, wrote a really good document on service proxying in general. Uh, I would start there. It's a great place to start. And then you can also get involved in both Cube proxy, which is a little more stable, so there's less good first issues, um, but dive in. Let's get involved. We can all work there together. And then Kaping, there is a lot of good first issues. Um, so check those out, get involved, reach out, um, and yeah, let's have fun and build together. All right. Okay. Now, last but not least, we have some features that have been in development and are reaching either the beta or the GA stage. So first we have topology aware hints. I think everyone probably, if you are on a cloud provider has experienced this problem where you have a deployment that spans multiple zones. And then when you create a service from them, all of those endpoints kind of get swizzled into just a single endpoint or a bunch of endpoint slices. What topology aware hints does is actually use the topology, which is like the zone information to kind of separate these. So you can control where your traffic is going. I know that in a lot of cloud providers, there's a charge when you send traffic across zones. So this feature lets you keep your traffic within zones as much as possible. One thing you might be wondering is why is it called hints? It's that you know there is a trade-off between reliability and sort of localizing your traffic. And in, in some ways, the hints gives the system a bit of flexibility in terms of how to make that trade-off for you. And Rob, what is the status? It's currently beta, but GA? GA and the next release or two. Okay, so you should be able to use it because it's a beta feature, but hopefully you'll graduate to GA soon and you'll be able to use it in all of your distributions. Um, the next feature I think is like a pretty critical one. So originally uh, the behavior of Kubernetes and kubeproxy is that if you have external traffic policy local, when the pod turns into a terminating state, the queue proxy will basically treat the pod because the pod disappears from the endpoints. So it will say, hey, the pod is not there. And then you may end up receiving traffic during this interval before the pod actually disappears that the traffic is dropped. We notice that, well, if the pod is still running on the node, it, we should probably still send it traffic if we're receiving traffic to it. 
So we should add an extra state called terminating so that the pod has some amount of time while it's still running to serve traffic. You might as well give it to the pod. You know, if it rejects it, then it will be dropped anyways. So this is what this, this proposal does. It adds this terminating state, which means that while your pods are shutting down, if some traffic lands on the node, we will deliver it instead of simply just dropping it. We give the pod just an extra you know, chance to kind of serve the traffic before dropping it. And I think a lot of people who have used external traffic policy local have experienced sort of this black hole state. For example, if they have like a long quiescence time between the pod going away and the endpoints getting updated. Another feature that's coming is network policy status. So network policy up until recently did not have a status field. And what we're finding is that um, as we're adding features to network policy that some providers may not actually implement everything. Some features are optional. So what this does is it allows you to indicate, for example, your implementation to indicate that, hey, you're using a feature that I may not necessarily support, or I can give you more information about what's going on with your network policy. I think the primary driver of this was the port range feature, which may or may not be supported right now with all the uh, implementations. And this, this lets you, when you, you know, use a configuration that uses port ranges to say, hey, I actually don't support this, just be aware. Finally, the last uh, feature that is reaching the next stage of graduation is internal traffic policy. So I think this is a very, very typical use case where you have a daemon set that you've deployed everywhere and you want it to receive the local traffic from the node. Internal traffic policy lets you basically say, hey, for this service, send it to this node local daemon rather than spraying it across your cluster. Um, I, as you may know, if you've been around for a while, that originally this was covered by the first version of the topology API uh, proposal, but since then we've kind of said, hey, this is a very distinct use case. We should kind of target it uh, with a targeted API versus just like a super generic one. Finally, I think this is the end of our presentation. So thank you so much for coming. And I think if you take away one thing, so if, if all the slides suddenly disappear in your mind, we, we really, really appreciate feedback from the users and participation in the SIG. It really helps us kind of shape what we are looking at. Are we looking at the right thing? Are we looking at the wrong things? So all of those QR codes, you know, you, can, you should visit them. If you're interested in any of the APIs or features, show up on the Slack, show up at the SIG meeting, make your voice heard. Thank you, and thanks to all my presenters. All right, so we will be running with microphones for questions. Here. Oh, Tim wants it. The mics. The mics. There you go. Whoa. Sorry. <laughs> and to conclude, I will drop the mic. <laughs> Any questions? Bring it on, people. Yeah, make them hard. Hi. Uh, so uh, I have a, um, a question about topology aware hints. Uh, so since it was uh, introduced, it replaced the previous feature. Uh, but uh, right now, it's it's really in a completely unusable state in some topologies uh, because it actually decides for the user what an imbalance is within the cluster and does not have the user an opportunity to say whether that's okay or not. So let's say, for example, that I have a, a workload in my cluster. Uh, I have a, an instance group or a node group that's running on spot and I don't have uh, many control about the, the zones where it runs, but I don't care because the, the load balance, uh, the services that I want to load balance are um, not affected by those ASGs. So the, the, the feature will simply never put hints on my services regardless of uh, whether uh, they are running there or not. Uh, there was some uh, change in 134 to actually exclude the control plane nodes um, by placing a filter on the label, but there's no way that I can configure a label in any other nodes to actually exclude it uh, from, from that as well. So are, are you planning to make that a, a, a little bit more configurable uh, for uh, when it reaches the, the stable release? Because right now, like in most of the clusters that I do have in production, it just cannot be used unless I scale the, the pod serving the service like uh, by a factor of uh, 30 or 40 uh, so that the, the calculation on the hard-coded value is skewed. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a really good question. Uh, 
We're, we've had lots and lots of conversations about topology. We've gone back and forth with a few different approaches. Uh, it's really hard to get right. Uh, and, and I appreciate your feedback. We're, we're seeing a lot that the, the current approach really struggles without a large number of endpoints, like, like you're showing, right? Uh, and we've, we, you know, one of the common feature requests we've had is, can you just, you know, prefer the same zone? If, if there's any endpoints in that same zone, can you route it there? Uh, that seems to work for a number of use cases, but the reason the default, the default approach doesn't do that is because it's very scary, right? The, the idea that you can overload traffic to a specific zone, uh, you know, if there's, you know, all your traffic is originating from one zone, you only have one endpoint there, and your other zones are where all the new endpoints are getting scheduled. You know, this is, this is really a cross-sig problem where we, we also need to work with auto-scaling, scheduling, et cetera, to, to help make this a little bit easier so that if all your traffic is coming from one place, it also, you know, new pods spin up in that place. Uh, it's a complex thing. Uh, we are working on improvements and really, really value additional uh, use cases. And, and if, if there are things that are not working like this, like I'm trying to gather all the use cases that we're missing right now and figure out how we represent that, how we solve those problems. Uh, so just a, a, a quick thing to add there, the, the, the faults are, are perfectly uh, sensible, so it makes sense all the decisions taken uh, to actually put them in place. I think the only thing that's uh, lacking is that it's not a default, it's a hard requirement because there's no way to configure it or to yeah. change the behavior uh, if, yeah. if we did to. Yeah, no, you're, you're right. It, it's always this balance of trying to give, you know, trying to do what's best for many use cases and not give too many knobs. We were hoping, oh, we can do this without any knobs, and I think we probably need some, but trying to limit the number we provide. You know, we're trying to make this as, you know, as need as minimal configuration as possible while still working for most use cases. That's a tough balance, but understanding those use cases helps a lot, so. Do you have a GitHub issue that tracks what you're looking for? Uh, probably not. But okay, it, 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 yeah. okay, that would be great. More questions. Who, who's got some? Hello. When I create a load balancer and my backend for this load balancer inside the same cluster, there will be shortcut traffic. But I want to go through the load balancer. How can I do it? Thank you. I think this depends on the CNI and environment, as I recall. Or yeah, go ahead, Antonio. That, that's implementation specific. In queue proxy, you get that behavior. So the traffic shortcuts because, uh, I mean, it, when a pod in a cluster wants to reach the service, you can decide, or I send it back, and the load balancer send it again to the cluster, or you can say, I know that the service is in the cluster, and I send it directly. The problem is that there is no solution to fit all. You know, there are some load balancers that, that doesn't work. And this was a decision for QProxy IP table, right? Yeah, I was just going to say, why, why do you want that behavior? Because QProxy will load balance it itself, so. For example, HTTPS termination. Uh, for example, I want to terminate HTTPS on load balancer. I don't want a shortcut to my service, which has no termination. Uh, OK, so you. you... So the, there is a, a cap or something that was open that started this work and then got sort of abandoned. I picked it up, but I've been a little busy to finish it. So it is sort of something in progress where the way we've described it is a IP mode for load balancers. So you can say this IP mode is a virtual IP, which means you, you really do have to short circuit it, or this mode is a proxy, which you don't want to short circuit it. So work in progress, but not done. Um, with the network policy stuff, I'm really excited to see the kind of like cluster-wide network policies because this has been a real pain point for us. Um, kind of coming from a more network security background, one of the things that I've really struggled with with the API generally is like getting a complete understanding about all the policies that apply to something and like trying to understand. And I feel like that's only going to get more complicated now that I've got different tiers of policy. And you were talking about how like the cluster ones rank first, which I guess makes sense, but then you need like exceptions for specific things and it's gonna become a mess. So like, do you guys kind of expect that to be something that like external tools try to solve? Is that something that you guys think about? Kind of like, what's your thinking about that? 
That's a really, really great question. So we actually did a talk fully on admin network policy as part of the Contributor Summit. So please go check that out. It'll answer some of those questions. The short gist of it is, yeah, we're making it really complicated, right? We're gonna have less users with the, these admin policies. So that'll be easier, but how they interact with existing network policy and how those two new objects, admin network policy and baseline admin network policy interact with each other is complicated. So as part of our cap and as part of our charter, we've put in, we are going to be building developer tooling. Like, it is key. We are going to be building conformance testing and developer tooling. Like, we don't want this to roll out and just be confusing for everyone because that was one of our main problems with network policy in the first place. No hate, it was an amazing API for developers, but admins need more. So it's, it's definitely on the roadmap. Please come and help. <laughs> we need help. Hello. Uh, related to ANP, uh, currently we have some applications or operators which are cluster scoped, namespace scoped, right? Cluster scoped uh, can listen to like all the namespaces. It can talk to all the namespaces. And the ANP policies, you are saying namespace, uh, like they can talk to each other, right? Are we? So it'll allow you, it's very flexible. So admin network policy is a new object that will allow you to select everything in the cluster as a whole or yeah. pods in a namespace. Mm -hmm. And you'll also be, still be able to use network policy like you always have. Mm -hmm. um, you'll just be able to define unique levels of enforcement, right? So, mm -hmm. so for those applications, we can no need of a cluster scope then, just a regular, we can just deploy and then apply these ANPs so that the operator running on namespace A can reach out to all the namespaces. Yes, you should be able to express something that like can that. that will be slowly going away then. Yep, and we have a list of use cases on our website, which the QR code was for, and um, in our talk from Contributor Summit. We're looking to expand on those lists of use cases for V1 Alpha 2, so get involved. Again, we, we need to hear from you. <laughs> just, just to be clear, it's not making network policy go away, it's answering a different question. So the, the example that I like to use the best, I have a cluster and I have two tenants, there's Coke and there's Pepsi, right? Coke has a bunch of namespaces, Pepsi has a bunch of namespaces. Admin network policy lets me say, all the namespaces for tenant Coke can talk to themselves and all the namespaces for tenant Pepsi can talk to themselves, but they can never talk to each other, no matter what the user does. And then within those namespaces, they can use network policy to define the correct behavior of their applications. So there's a, a two different questions, two different roles. Hi. Um, so I have a quick question on Kuproxy and uh, Kuproxy NG, um, and just basically about the improvements that come with it. So from my understanding, uh, it looks really promising in terms of you know new backends that can happen. But what about existing backends? So let's say I'm running Kuproxy with IP tables. I'm happy with IP tables. Is there any reason for me to run Kuproxy NG right now with IP tables? It provides a more flexible deployment model today if you want. So. Uh, Qproxy is a daemon set, right? There's a mm -hmm. per node agent. And in Kuping, today you can run it uh, not like that. You can run one central Kuping agent that talks to many nodes. So it allows you in really high scale scenarios to take some pressure off the API server. That would be the main selling point, I would say. OK, thank you. You won't have all of the queue proxies actually connecting to the API server as well and watching all of the endpoints. And the endpoint slices, even if the endpoint slices, they solve this problem. Right. So you have just one control plane and that's all. Yep. I also had a question about uh, K-Ping. Um, K-Ping, K -ping. K -ping. <laughs> whatever you want to call it, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're in process. I like K-Ping. Uh, yeah, it's the new kubectl discussion. Um, how does it relate to, or is there any relation between, like, say, supporting eBPF and then maybe network policy getting some enhancements out of that, like being able to write layer seven policies or something? Um, I don't think that Kaping architecture necessarily relates to like a new type of network policy. Yeah. That is another thing. If you want to work on a new network policy, come talk to us. Again, we need help. Um, it's more about 
making backends easier to write. So one day it could apply to network policy backends maybe, but not necessarily about like new policy types. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Hi, um, I don't have a use case for this, but does gateway class support arbitrary layer four protocols? We, oh, Rob, go ahead. Sure. Uh, so yeah, the, so gateway for L4 is very much uh, still in alpha and experimental, but by, by definition we support TCP and UDP today. Uh, one of the key things with this API, you may have noticed that we had uh, a few different route types by default, but anyone can plug and play their entirely own custom protocol as a different route type using the same pattern and the rest of the API just plugs in perfectly. So if you want entirely new route types and protocols, that would work. Uh, what kind of L4 protocols were you thinking of? Uh, I don't know, like, oh. uh, I really don't have a use case for this yet, but there, isn't there some stuff with, um, like something to do with HTTP, uh, HTTP3 where you can even replace the layer four? I, I don't know, there's something that I'm, that's yeah, there are, my mind. Yeah, there are a number of tunneling protocols. So right now, in terms of the upstream project, we have TLS, UDP and TCP on the L4. And actually, we're trying hard to kind of get experience on those so we can graduate them, uh, you know, into like the, from experimental to like beta. Um, and then of course, HTTP is like, a, like the most common one. So that's, that's the one we know the most about. So that's the one that's kind of moved the furthest along. But if you have like, I'm trying to think of MQTT, like you're free to kind of implement SCTP. that. SCTP. S oh, SMTP. Okay. <laughs> TP, S, P, S, P. Oh, S, C, T, P. <laughs> Purely selfishly, I'm hoping the L4 gateways make the service API less important. Because a lot of the service API is crufty and old and broken and should be taken out and shot. <laughs> and now we're done with questions, actually. So we're out of time. Oh, Sorry, if you want to stick around, then, you know, come talk. Stick around. All of us up front. There's but. a lot of Signet folks here. We'll hang out for a little while if you want to talk. Thanks for everybody. Thank you.